the house is worth whatever it's worth, right? Whoever sells it. Uh, uh, wrong. I'm Charlie. Welcome to Moving Home with Charlie, and thank you for coming. Charlie Landon grew up in Sussex, is the founder of Best Agent and presenter of Moving Home with Charlie. If you want to find one of these guys, look out for those compassionate professionals. All estate agents are not the same. So, Charlie, what would be your advice for people interested in buying new builds right now? Don't overpay. Do buy, but don't overpay. That's why I say disregard the guff. Read into the numbers and look, and it's buried. The bad news is buried in the small print, okay? Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Property Press Awards. They may or may not be telling the truth, but you should form your own view. Get out and view, get out and view, get out and view. You cannot be in a position to make offers and have the offers accepted if you're not viewing. Just be out there viewing. Pre pref uh. <laughs> Pay attention to the back of the class if you've not been watching my videos. I did one just a couple of days ago. Disregard the guff, guys. Hello everybody, welcome to another live stream with me, Charlie. This is Moving Home with Charlie, and I'm back home at my desk, as you can see. Um, this is a really important uh, video. One of the things I've watched after 25 years of working in the moving industry alongside agents is that there are a lot of deals. When you're buying or selling, you have a lot of deals that fall through. And deals that fall through are always a disappointment for at least one side of the party, sometimes both. And there are reasons that deals fall through that are beyond anyone's control. Sometimes people just change their mind at the last minute and there's nothing anyone can do about that. But what is just crushingly disappointing is when a deal falls through and that could have been avoided. And the purpose of this video is to explain to you why the topic of conveyancing, which is a legal thing and it's very legal and technical and most people don't really understand the nitty gritty of it and you don't need to, right? But why it is, if you're a buyer, the most important decision you'll make is who you use for conveyancing and when you engage them. And if you're a seller, it's second only in importance to your choice of estate agent. Now, I'm all for saving money in life on the regular outgoings and stuff. But when it comes to one-off hiring of professional services, it's almost always a, a, a mistake to go cheap. And when people do go cheap, whether it's with an estate agent or a conveyancer, they usually end up regressing it because the deal falls through and it could have been avoided. So I would love you all to bring your questions. I've got a special guest today and it's, it's Simon David. He's the CEO of Thomas Legal which is a firm of conveyances that, that I took a long time selecting and choosing to make sure that they lived up to my expectations of what I want for you guys, the audience, if you decide to use my partners for whether it's my mortgage brokers uh, or my conveyancing partners now uh, or the search pack provider. Um, so we're going to have a chat about it. We're going to just basically discuss what is conveyancing, not get technical about it, but just the important points about it, um, and take any questions you've got. We're not taking any personal questions about personal situations. That's not the point of this. But if you've got general questions about conveyancing, um, by all means, put them in the live chat. Um, but without further ado, let me welcome in Simon. Hello, Simon. How are you? Hey, Charlie. Yeah, very good. Thank you. Very good indeed. Thank you very much for joining me on this. So this is Simon David, the CEO of Thomas Legal, who in a former life was an estate agent and then a financial advisor, including mortgages. So you really have seen all the different aspects of the overall transaction process, which actually in some ways I think gives you an advantage over other conveyances. You haven't sat in the shoes of an estate agent or, or, or an IFA trying to get a deal over the line. So um, if I may, can I please ask you the most basic simple question, which is, what is conveyancing and why do movers have to have it? So conveyancing in, in, in and I don't want to use legal speak, but it is basically there to transfer the deeds of a property from a seller to a buyer. That is it. That is all. That's all it boils down to. Uh, and there's lots of complications around that. But that that is ultimately what happens. And the deeds are registered. The deeds are with the land registry and they're electronic. Uh, and the solicitor, the solicitors obviously uh, correspond with each other uh, by email, you hope. Uh, and then after a number of weeks, uh, when contracts are exchanged and uh, the buyer gets the keys to the property eventually on the, on the day of completion, the solicitor then registers 
i.e. sends a, a documentation into the land registry and then the buyer becomes the the owner legally of that property. Okay, fantastic. And of course, the buyer and the seller have to have their own conveyances, don't they? So there's the conveyance. Yeah, that, yeah, that's an interesting one because uh, yes, the rules say that only in exceptional circumstances should the uh, seller and the buyer use the same firm. Some firms, I'm afraid, still try and circumvent the rules and say that it's in the best interest of both clients to instruct them. Uh, I think there's a, a innate there's a, there's a conflict of interest there. So in general terms, yes, there should be. Uh, separate firms acting yeah. for buyer and yeah, seller. Yeah. Okay. And um, would I be right in saying, would you agree with the statement that in the last 10 to 15 years, the conventing process has had mission creep and it started to include a lot more stuff than it used to, which is one of the reasons that it's become... Uh, the conveyancing industry and sector and the conveyancing process comes in for a really bad time all the time. It's constantly being battered and... and and bruised and accused of all this kind of stuff and causing and of course it can be true there are very very poor conveyancing firms aren't there who do contribute to deals failing that's definitely true and and so there is some legitimate criticism of that but i do think it's always important for especially people anyone considering who to use uh for their conveyancing needs to understand a little bit about actually how complicated it is because what you've just described is well yeah well we just we just email the other side it's easy. To yeah. It and it's done. <laughs> yeah 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 I, I mean i started in 1996 um having as you said being a, having been an ifa and, and being an agent for that um and back in the day uh, when we would send an when we we're active for buyer we'd send an advice letter which is probably two pages uh of advice and then you know you'd go ahead and and, and do the deal Nowadays, solicitors that are acting for buyers are have to be experts on planning. They have to be experts experts on mortgages. They've got to be experts on all these different sort of searches which are carried out, and we've got to uh, give advice on that. I mean, I saw the other day that we're having to now potentially give advice on whether climate change is going to affect the property. Mm. Uh, we've got a new Building Safety Act which has come out, which is massively complicated. Uh, and, and many firms are now saying, oh, we're not acting on leasehold property purchases. Um, so th things have got much, much more complicated. And I suppose when we give advice now, it is pages and pages. And sadly, part of it is to is to cover our own backsides, um, as well as making sure that we give the correct advice to the clients. Conveyancing is the highest risk area uh, in, in law from a professional indemnity insurance point of view. It's where all the claims are uh, over above any other area of law. So consequently, it's very, very expensive when you have a conveyancing firm to actually even get insurance um, because it is such a such a high risk area. But yes, it has changed enormously. And you're quite right. The, the sad thing is, as we've had to give more and more advice, that length of time has just got bigger and bigger and bigger. We're now at a, what, 136 days or something across the country. It's bonkers. It's totally bonkers. Yeah. And um, so there, yeah, that's, oh, no, I think it's even higher than that. I think right, we've said it was 150 something days. Well, there we go. Yeah, so it's changed again. <laughs> but I mean, that's, it's really important that people need to understand, don't they, that no one is the average transaction, are they? I mean, there's no such thing as the average transaction exists. There's a different, there are different parties, yeah. different properties, different locations, different finances, different local authorities, di all, all these different things. Um, do you have, I'm sorry, I'm going to blindside you with this. Do you have your firm's sort of average transaction time? Um, yeah, I, I mean, it depends on the month to month. Um, so the last two years, um, when the market was booming, uh, we controlled our volumes and, and many other lawyers didn't control our volumes. And, uh, and the average lockup was around 135 days, not because we were slow, but just because we were, you can only go as, as quickly yeah. as the slowest as one of the other chain. Yeah. Uh, some of our, we, we've done a pilot in the last year where we, we've been running uh, to get to completion and we've been running at about 59, 60 days, which is incredible. Um, and we can talk about that. But in general terms, we, we run between 100 and 120. That's about where we are, depending right. on, as you say, pin line transaction. Uh, the quickest transaction we ever did was uh, one day. Wow. Um, that was a multi-million pound transaction in London. And uh, I'm, safe, I'm pleased to say that we, we beat Janet Jackson to the deal um and uh, that was a, that was a really interesting deal and um so you can do it in a day if, if you really put your mind to it uh, the other day we came in we stepped in because a conveyancer had 
I basically cocked it up um, and uh, we uh, we managed to get that over the, over the line from start to finish in, in, in three days. Wow. OK. OK. Well, I think one of the most interesting points you just made is is how expensive the professional indemnity insurance is because you know, because of how risky the process is. And I think yeah. if you're a, a mover, it's worth thinking about that. Risky? What? Risky? I thought it was just admin. There are real in, real risks. I mean, there are risks of moving house. There are risks of making a purchase that, that, that goes wrong. There are risks of ending up in a property you can't sell. All these kind of things. And so, you know, when you are moving, if you're selling to buy or just buying, you're trying to get into a new home, what you don't want is, is, is a whole host of nightmares you didn't know were going to be there. And I suppose that's part of the process of convincing, isn't it? Is to give the buyer some comfort that they what they're buying is fit for purpose at least is that right yeah yeah ab absolutely so you say so you've got the the legal aspects of purchasing is is this correct from a legal point of view but also is the person that you're buying the property from are they are they legit right is the solicitor acting for the seller are they legit yeah are you going to get to the stage where you try and register as a certain beginning you're going to register you're going to send in this documentation to the land registry who, who will change the name on the deeds and the land registry going to turn around and go, I'm sorry, this is not a legitimate transaction. Oh. And then you've lost all your money potentially. Um, mm. So a lot of the delays in conveyancing come from you, someone. So, so when someone comes on board with us, we're having to obviously make sure that they're, they're, they are who they say they are, but more, more crucially, where's the money coming from? Yeah. Where's the source of these funds? Where's the source of wealth? Have they got a family that are giving them some money? Where's the money coming from, from the family? Have we identified the family? So you, you can imagine if you're getting a gift from um, a couple of parents on both sides, there's a couple, both getting gifts from each, each parent, it takes an enormous amount of time to, to make sure that that is all legit. Because if it's not legit, then we're allowing funds to wash through our, our account. And in effect, we are helping with money laundering. And that is the, one of the biggest challenges for any solicitor's yeah. practice at the moment. It's a massive, massive problem for us right yeah okay so again i think it's very very important a, a, a lot of buyers are sold or have referred to them conveyances based on referral arrangements between agents and convincing firms especially the larger firms yeah where there's no real interest or care it, it you are just a number aren't you in a, in a, in a, in a sort of massive <laughs> In a, in a very high volume operation, some high volume estate agencies, high volume convincing. And yet this is one of the most important transactions you'll ever make in your life, if not the most important transaction. Do you really want to save a few hundred quid? You know, it's 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 such a false economy and, and the number of people I see kick themselves. So let me just well, talk so about- I just, So I just say on that point, what's very odd is although the volume conveyances you call them may be cheaper, on online and you put the quote in what you don't see at the time is all the add-ons is all the additions right. so because sadly as you say with the very big conveyancing operations that take work from a, a, a panel manager so you're an estate agent you've got thousands of transactions every year you give it to a panel manager the panel manager then panels the work out to various solicitors within that transaction that panel manager is taking a fee from the solicitor the estate agent is taking a fee from the solicitor the the list sorry the, the the panel manager may be controlling the whole search process and may be getting some money from that as well yeah. there's a lot of people trying to take money out of this process yeah which actually means the poor consumer has to pay more uh, yeah well daniel from probably such a direct that's our search back partner yeah he's, he says the same thing so it's, you know when it's going through panel managers sometimes it really really can be hideously unfair on the movers and not just what they're paying but also the quality of the work that they're going to get i i'd love to ask you something actually again just putting you on the spot what is it that you think makes your firm different from average conveyances that's a good question i think the one thing that i when i speak to clients the one thing that a lot of solicitors get wrong is communication it's communication, communication, communication every single time. And there's lots of traditional firms out. There's 10,000 conveyances still, still lots of, sorry, 10,000 solicitors still doing conveyancing because it's quick money in, in legal terms. It's, it's over within three months, as you know, as opposed to personal injury can take years. Um, 
so the, the the problem is the traditional model is a solicitor has a secretary or an assistant and you've got to get past the receptionist um and and that tends to be a very very slow way of doing things the way we have our teams is that you have a dedicated lawyer in fact what happens in our teams we have two lawyers in each team so the biggest complaint when you talk about communication is oh my lawyer's gone on holiday i ring up nothing's going to happen for two weeks that still happens a lot right. so we thought well how the hell do we get get around that one well i'll tell you what we'll do we'll put two lawyers in each team so that's the first thing and then the second thing is right well all the admin type stuff and there's a lot of procedure in conveyancing so it might be you know collecting id or collecting funding evidence all that sort of thing well that can be done by someone else in the team so my teams will usually have a couple of lawyers and then they'll have a support team behind them uh, and that is absolutely crucial you've got to have enough people so that the the, the what we call the lockup time this time to get to exchange of contracts completion doesn't suffer when when people are on holiday it's just no. not fair on the clients no no and of course you know as you probably know that there is a direct correlation between time and chance of failure Absolutely. There, there is a graph the longer it takes the higher the chance of a fall through so yep. you, you don't want your deal falling through because someone was on holiday and that literally happens yeah it does and then you ring up and and and, and the <laughs> The locum, they, you know, a locum solicitor is someone that they just get in for a couple of weeks. So can you imagine what that's like? You come in as a solicitor, you have no idea about the case. Um, I, I don't know if any of your any of your viewers will actually know how many cases that most conveyances will have on the go at any one time. Um, they're probably quite staggered to hear it'll be between, a, it could be 80 to 150 or even 200. Now, when you've got that number of cases, you bring in your locum who comes in for a couple of weeks, they won't have a clue. So actually, they can't really do very much in those two weeks. Um, or you'll get the slitters, or, or you ring up and, and the, 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 uh, the secretary will say, well, they're on holiday, I'm afraid. Um, there's something on tape. And you think, really? <laughs> what? So slitters still use a dictating machine and it'll go to the secretary, the assistant, and then it'll be, you know, oh. typed up. You know, we, there is a bit of digital dictation going on, but it might be on tape five. I and mean, I still hear those sorts of things. Um, or you'll send an email and they'll say, um, and you'll see this a lot, is um, the, uh, the the firm will come back and you'll get an automated response saying, we treat emails like we treat incoming post. We'll we'll come back to you in the next two or three days. I mean, <sighs> honestly, this sort of thing is quite extraordinary, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, well, yeah, I, we've all met businesses that operate like that. It's a nightmare. I just, yeah, I, we've got some really good questions coming in. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, Really good questions, which we'll, we'll pop through in a minute. Um, but I just want to wrap up with this. I mean, my own experiences are that a really great conveyancer will actually save and rescue a deal that would otherwise have fallen through. I, I've seen where and where there can be really technical legal problems uh, with the title, for example, uh, and that you know which which affect the lending and this and suddenly the lender's going to back out because oh hang on a second it's actually not one title it's two titles and there's you know they've they haven't revealed the second title's got some, another person on it and there's this you know and, and a really good conveyancer will know what to do and will get it done really quickly and hold it together yeah uh, whereas yeah. A, a ordinary everyday person might just oh it's got too complicated and, uh, so if you as a mover put yourself in the position that you've think how long it's taken you to find the home you want to buy. Think how hard it was to get your offer accepted. Think how long it took you to get your mortgage lined up. Think how long it took conveyancing. You've paid for your conveyancing. Think how many months you've been waiting for the deal to go through, right? And you're that close to the deal. And then because of basically administrative incompetence or laziness, or someone's on holiday. <laughs> yes. Or has got the note from your last call on a tape your deal falls through after the nine or 10 or 11 months that you've been fighting to make it happen. This is just not worth cutting corners on conveyancing ever, ever, ever. It's, you know, I, I actually have conversations quite often, like personal conversations, with people who talk to me privately about moving about, about the conveyancing process. And, and when they say, well, you know, this, should we do this or should we do that? We've felt this otherwise a bit cheaper. I said, look, what would you rather do everything in your power to maximize the chances of the transaction completing and knowing that if it then fails, you couldn't have done any more or you cut a bit of a corner and then it fails and you wonder what would have happened if you hadn't cut that corner. You just kick yourself. Mm. You know, it's, it's, it's a sliding doors moment in life when those deals do or don't go through. 
Uh, you're you're back yeah, to square yeah, one. Yeah. You've lost a year sometimes of your life. Yeah, I, I've had people messing like this. So um, I can't express enough how important it is, which is why I've gone to the trouble of of finding a convincing partner and, and to, to line up with my the mortgage guys who you know, don't you? Uh, the mortgage yeah. partners um, and the search pack provider. We're putting together a, a, a posse I'm proud of, actually, <laughs> a real a, a sort of a provider pack for people who can't find people they trust. What I would say is this on this video. If you're working with an estate agent you really trust and they recommend someone for the right reasons because they've worked with them for years and they get stuff over the line and you're getting a personal recommendation that you actually think, I trust this recommendation. You should go with that. You should go with someone that you think is the right one for you first and foremost. But if you can't find that, if you don't have a provider where you really are confident this is a very, very good choice, then that's why I've teamed up with Simon to provide you with convincing if you can't find someone that you're happy with that you're worried about it okay i'm i'm kind of pinning my reputation to simon's reputation no pressure um as i have done uh with the mortgage guys so far and they have not let me down so far um and on the search packs um and so i'm excited to do this now let's get to some questions um we've got some really good questions question number one i'll put it on screen so Atmosphere One from YouTube says, my buyer solicitor won't reply to my solicitor or the estate agent. The buyers are apparently fed up with him too. He is the lead partner in a full solicitor firm. What can I do? Yeah, it's a very common problem. And it's it's very sad that that, that does happen. Um, if, if they're not responding, I mean, ultimately, although you're not their client, so you, you can still potentially complain um if you've got some hard evidence that that that, that is actually happening um you, you you might be able to complain to the solicitor's regulation authority if they're literally not doing what they're supposed to be doing i.e., they're not corresponding with anyone um you can keep putting pressure on the on your own solicitor to, to speak to them. they won't speak to you if you ring them directly um because as i said professional yeah. courtesy says they don't have to speak to you mm -hmm. so i think your only your only step there is to complain you might be able to complain to the ombudsman the legal ombudsman but again i think that's tricky because you're not the client it's a very very common one this and it all boils down to this thing i said about communication yeah. so this is a very bad i'm sorry to say as a profession at communicating yeah um so well, yeah. i mean a lot of estate agents aren't brilliant at communicating either i know that from from first-hand experience and it's it's such a basic thing to get right and actually if you are a good efficient and timely communicator everything else gets easier yeah agreed um Thanks for that question. Sarah, who's watching on Facebook, says, Hi, Charlie. Will a conveyancer take offence if you buy a search pack and still need their help? Thanks. So in other words, if, 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 uh, if you've bought your own search pack and then you pick a conveyancer and go, here's my search pack. No, absolutely. Well, some will because they think <laughs> it's for them to be doing and, and you know, what are you doing? How do you know what to put in a pack? Um, but no, ultimately not. As long as the pack, the search pack is is correct and hasn't been done by someone that hasn't got the right yeah. regulatory status. Um, but as long as you used a, a proper regulated search provider, absolutely no problem at all. Um, it is it is there for your benefit. It's also there for your mortgage lender's benefit. Um, but no, we from our point of view, absolutely not a problem. And, yeah. and actually, get a search pack quicker than the solicitor getting it. Well, that's brilliant. It's going to save you some time. So. Absolutely. Speed up the transaction, exactly. Yeah. What you, what you um, don't want to do is keep buying search packs every time you go and offer a property. That's going to cost you a lot of money. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So do it yeah. when you've got an offer accepted. And Wait for the office you've had a survey yeah. done. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Gothmog on YouTube, um, who says he's also earlier said he finally made a live stream. He's always missing them. Um, what's the reason for the mega delay with land mm -hmm. registry figures coming out? Once the convincing work is done and the sale has gone through, shouldn't it be as easy as them logging the figure on their system? Yeah, great question. Um, cuts, uh, public sector cuts in the land registry. They did it uh, some years ago, never recovered. Um, and we can send in something. Uh, my own stepdaughter, actually, we send in a... We sent in a, a new build uh, lease uh, property in London, and I think it was two years before we actually got that registered. Get that registered in their name. It's unacceptable um, that those that those delays happen. There is no real rhyme or reason. It is just down to the ability for the land registry to get it done in house, and and that sadly is down to to level of staffing. 
right? That's and my interpretation. The, the, the efficiency of those systems as well. But I mean, according to my um, stats guy, housing stig who you may be familiar with he's i call him ai stig as in actual intelligence stig so uh, um he actually opens up the spreadsheets when the government put the numbers out and last month the land registry's housing house price index only contained seven percent of transactions hmm. for that month it tells you a lot doesn't it it really does. Um, I do solicitors. I did. We did have one the other day where the solicitor we, we were selling it, and the solicitor actually had not ever registered, had forgotten to register the the current owner as as the owner. So they were a bit of a shock when they when they got the deeds, and and actually it was a person previous to them that actually was still shown as being the owner. <laughs> Unbelievable. Um, um, question, question. No, I'll just take this. Alex Whitaker says, "Sorry, but what's a search pack, and is it something I need as a first time buyer?" Um, if you go and look at my channel, uh, Alex, we, I did a video interview with the search pack provider, Daniel. We did two. We did a short one and a long one on exactly that topic. What is a search pack and why you need one? Uh, so just, just look up property search pack, movie over Charlie, and you'll find the video that answers that question. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. Next question coming up is uh, just briefly. Yeah, I would like to ask you this as well. Craig Wood says, what's your guest's take on where the market is at the moment and where it's heading? Before you answer that, can I just point out that we're in a week when I, I feel like last week, a, 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 a fresh chill just descended on the investment marketplace, the housing market, the, the fact that core inflation went up and what that means for, for interest rates and that they are not coming down anytime soon. They're gonna keep going up and it's gonna, and the factor in the time lag of interest rates actually affecting the market. And suddenly, even the people who've been the strongest people talking the market up are realizing we're in for 18 months of house price falls, whether you like it or not. It's just, there's just no other way of cutting it. Ignoring how far they fall, but definitely 18 months where there, there's gonna be no house price growth whatsoever. And I, we also this morning, the ONS published uh, transaction volumes for April, which are down 29% on March, which is quite a shock for this time of year. Spring bounce not happening. Mm -hmm. But you are actually at the coalface. You you are seeing what happens between deals being agreed and exchanges happening. So you, you'll have your own views on fall through rates, uh, people backing out of transactions. You, you obviously have that situation when people just, they just pull out, don't they? Yeah, um, and we we budget for about twenty percent of full full through rates. I mean, if you ask estate agents, traditionally it's always been around thirty thirty three percent something yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, we've had a, a mixed first quarter. Um, it was it was certainly down probably twenty percent. I would think around that sort of time. Uh, we had a very good May, weirdly, um, and April wasn't too bad for us. This is on new business coming yeah. into the into the business. Okay. Um, you have to remember the upper market is deeply seems to be deeply unaffected by cost of living crisis, interest rate rises. You know, we're getting 40, 50 percent of people that, that are still transacting without the need for a mortgage, for example. Okay. Um, so there is still a lot of um, yeah. cash out there. Um, and I, you, you, you know the stats better than I do. But there's still a huge owning percentage of the population yeah. that don't have any mortgage finance at all on their properties 62 uh, percent um, or something i mean it's like staggering that. isn't it where is all this cash <laughs> yeah um so yes we are seeing things take longer um the the, the, the time to take the tra the transaction time is not not changing massively um our numbers are 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 steady i think what you have to remember also is when we talk about a national um we talk about national statistics. There are still areas yeah. of England that are still very, very sought after. London seems to be coming back again, yeah. um, particularly the sort of flat market, because what we're seeing is that all those people that were working remotely who all moved out to the countryside, um, A, don't like it now, um, or, or, or B, their bosses are saying, you're coming back to the office now. And we've seen this with the banks particularly. Um, you know, you go to the city on a Friday. I've been down in London for empty and that is now slowly changing. So London busy. Um, we do 50% of our business in London. Um, Southwest is pretty buoyant. Um, I'm currently in Devon at the moment, and it's it's certainly quieter than it has been on the housing market. Um, so it's yeah, I would say it was a mixed bag and does depend a lot on where you live. Okay. All right. Um, next question. Tired Gunasaurus on YouTube says, with Thomas Legal, 
they do end to end of the buying process from start to exchange to land registry. Yes. So I think, uh, do you do that? Yes, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yes. And in fact, we do it uh, as early as possible to, to speed up the process, especially right. if you're selling. We'll get you, if we can, at the time you put your property in the market, and that will save you weeks. Yeah. 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 <sighs> Weeks when you weeks. when you talk about how poor they are communicating a lot of a lot of solicitors you can understand why uh, how, you know, how weeks can click past before they actually start ordering stuff and actually getting the you know, weeks and those weeks clicking past it's just the chance of fall through rising well that one i told you about that we did in in two days um the solicitor had gone all the way through the process and then just before the exchange of contracts when it's binding on everybody uh, decided to then look at and uh, the finance side um of the buyer uh, for their client and looking into it and actually wasn't comfortable with that. Now, that should be happening before you do any work. The rules are very clear on that. Now, what is a solicitor doing? Doing all that work and then six weeks, seven weeks, eight weeks later saying to the client, I'm not really happy with where your funding is coming from. Yeah. That's just bonkers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, this isn't a question, but it's a comment worth making. Stitcher B on YouTube says, we had six collapsed chains wow. before the seventh time lucky chasing the conveyance was so tedious in the end the successful purchase sale was down to a great conveyancer and a fab agent chaser so grateful thanks yeah. stitchy for sharing that story with us because it is really good to understand i mean six collapsed chains that's that's oof. not on that's, that's not really on. some agents have really good chain chasers um sales progressors um, who are dedicated just to do that um okay. and that that can help as well with the with the deal um, here's, a, here's a challenging question. This is a fair question. Charlie, what if your transaction is simple, generic, flat, in a BI, I'm not sure, don't mind if it takes a bit longer, and I don't mind bad communications, why not save a few pounds on cheapest conveyancer? I mean... Well, you run the risk. You run the risk that you, it's all very well saying, I don't mind if it's going to take a bit longer. But you're going to run the risk that you could lose the deal, which is what you said at the top of the call. Yeah, um, I, you know, I think. I mean, it, it is a fair question, but saving a few pounds is what you do when you're doing your supermarket shopping. Saving a few pounds is what you do when you want to fill up your car with petrol or diesel, and you realise one petrol station will save will save you a five over the other one. Uh, well, I, and I think the other point, which is, what if, what if it's a simple generic flat? Um, there is no such thing as a simple generic flat. I'm afraid um, right, every single flat. Uh, management scheme, whatever you want to call it, yeah. is different. And particularly now with the Building Safety Act, no yeah. such thing. There yeah. is really no such thing. That leasehold purchases are more dangerous than anything else. Yeah, and and the other thing is is this is it. I mean, with the with the the sort of approach that you're referring to, Sinad, it sounds like you don't really care if you get the flat or not. <laughs> yeah. Right. If That's you're trying to buy a home and getting into that home is important. I assume that getting into a home is more important than saving a few quid. So um, this is what I mean when I say it's, 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 if you if you go with a conveyancer who pitches themselves based on how cheap they are, if you're going to have, let's say, for example, laser eye surgery, would you go with the cheap guy? <laughs> Save a few quid. Why not? It's a simple, simple generic eye operation. <laughs> yeah. Why do most people buy German cars? It's not because they're cheap. You know, yeah, 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 exactly. Because yeah. the quality is better. It's, it's, it's like there's an old there's an old adage: buy cheap, buy twice. It's exactly. it's very very true. And you know, what yeah. you save in the in the. <sighs> well, I, I think in in legal terms, the worst thing, the absolute worst thing, is that how long do people stay in flats for? Particularly two years, three years, five years, something like that. Is you come to sell that property and you can't sell it, and the reason you can't sell it is because your cheapo conveyancer. Got it wrong warn you about it. yeah and that that is going to be a nightmare for you you're going to have to sue them you're yeah. going to sit in this flat you're not going to be able to get out of it that's just terrible yeah i'm sure there's an old harry enfield character that was just famous for for you know false economy always being pleased with himself for saving a few quid as his life falls apart around him i can't remember <laughs> what it was but um here's an interesting question it's not about convincing but it's I think a good question for you anyway. Alexander Robertson says, do estate agents sell to property developers merely to inflate prices and their selling commission? Now, you're a conveyancer, but you've been an agent. You work with agents. You know a lot of them. And this is purely an opinion. I mean, by all means, pass on that question if you don't want to answer it. But I, it's... Well, I'm not quite sure what the question means. Are you talking about 
selling properties to property developers rather than selling them to the, someone else. To a private buy, yeah. To private I, I, I mean, so this might be someone who's put an offer in and lost out, and the property's been sold to a developer because they've got. Well, like my my impression of developers, and it depends what you mean by developers, um, is actually they're not prepared to pay as much as Joe Public because obviously they're for profit. Yeah. especially if they're looking to turn the property over and you know do it up and sell it on uh, and i have to say the agents that i deal with are brilliant and professional and i don't think the that may be something that happened back in the day i'm not sure yeah. it happens now i think people you know they they they, they are most of them are regulated and i think that they're, they they take their jobs very seriously yeah. and they'll they'll put forward offers based on uh, well, they have to put off offers forward anyway, yeah. and they'll give recommendations based on the ability of that, that buyer to proceed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, right, a couple more really good questions, actually. Um, here we are. Sebastian Roberts says, if a mortgage offer expires because of delayed conveyancing, is there any ombudsman or oversight body to make complaints or compensation on losses? Yes. Um, I mean, the first thing you do is if you're not happy and you, you believe that the conveyancer was... Uh, was to blame for the delay, then you would ask the conveyancer for a copy of their complaints procedure. And in there, they will list exactly what you have to do to complain to them. And you then make your complaint. And if you're not happy with that complaint, then you can go to the legal ombudsman. Um, and the legal ombudsman will then look at your claim and decide what that, um, what that compensation would look like. Right. Um, if you feel that someone has been professionally negligent in the advice they've given, then generally you'd go down a different route, which would be to employ a, a specialist solicitor to take action against them for professional right. negligence. Okay. Thanks. That's a very useful question and answer. Thank you for that question, Sebastian. Um, and here we are. Posh82 on YouTube says, will the fleece hold ever be abolished? Freeholds that have management fees on top. Yeah. Yeah. We're getting confused here, I think, between freehold and leasehold. Freehold is when you own everything. There's no problem with freehold. That's the yeah, best. Yeah. And, and I think if you're talking about leasehold, which which has this ever diminishing, these ever diminishing returns as, as the lease term comes down, so the, the value becomes less. Yes, there is a lots of stuff happening with that. Uh, we have something called common hold, which is, has has been around for ages, which in effect means you your flat is in effect a freehold flat and you have a common hold scheme between the flat owners and but hasn't been very popular um but the government are looking to legislate um we hope in relation to um this this the, the diminishing um value of leaseholds when it gets under 80 years then the landlord can charge you to extend your lease and that may well go away um and that would be great if that does go away because it can be a lot of money to extend a lease and the landlords at the, at the moment, the landlords or freeholders, whatever you want to call them, they get some of the upside. Yeah. So if if you extend your lease and your value of your property is doubled, then the then the landlord will share in the uptick in value, and that's yeah. wrong, isn't it? Really. So. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Haley Master, who's watching on Facebook, says we've got different conveyances for our sale and purchase. One conveyancing specialist, one solicitors with partner acting. Both have poor comms issues compared to the good estate agents. Is that normal? Yeah, well, you've really put yourself in a fire there with with one doing the sale and one doing the purchase. I mean, that in itself is a is really difficult. Um, you're having to juggle with two different firms. Well, actually, sorry, it's worth clarifying, isn't it? So it's very important to, to, to we don't get confused. Um, you can't have. You can't have the seller and the buyer using the same solicitor. Correct, but you can if you are buying and selling. Use you should, the same solicitor you should be contract. using you should be using the same firm. You don't want yeah. to have to deal with two solicitors. That becomes much more complicated. Yeah. Sad that they have both. I mean, we talked about communication throughout this call. Um, yeah. Is it normal? Well, sadly, yes, it is. Yeah. Um, as I say, you, lots of these conveyances that are out there. High street conveyancer, he or she might be doing a bit of conveyancing. Then the next day they might be doing a will, then they might be doing a bit of, I don't know, litigation or a bit of matrimony, a bit of divorce. So they're juggling all these different balls. And sadly, that means that can lead to communication problems. And it, it's just not on. It just doesn't work for people and everyone gets frustrated. Um, we've got two people here, Graham Lysett and Luke M, both saying, Luke says, I've, uh, Graham says, I've recently seen freehold with a yearly management fee attached, question mark. And Luke says, there are freehold problems with management fees. They are a thing. Yes, they are, yeah. Um, 
on estates, on modern estates, so what you have is you'll have, you know, let's say 100 houses. Um, and then on the, on, on, on the houses, you might have like a communal play area or you might have, um, I don't know, parking for, for visitors, um, anything like that. And what happens is the, the developer, so let's say it's both the same or something, will, will put, that, put those communal areas in a company. And then all the owners of the properties in that estate will all become um, shareholders in that company. It doesn't make any right. money or anything. No. And then you all are responsible through that company in the upkeep of that uh, of those communal areas. So it's usually not a lot of money. It might be £100 a year or £50 a year or something like that. Okay. And those are estate management charges, yeah. Okay, yeah. So when your, your freehold house is on part of an estate and there are communal areas that need maintaining. Correct. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. But have there been some of those where developers have done that and they've they've actually but they have really turned the screw on those? Yeah. Um, well, those. The, well, there's been some bad press with developers and leasehold houses, particularly. Yeah, um, okay. the state management charges aren't usually too much of a problem as long as the company's been set up properly. And you know, the, the problem you have sometimes is that the property actually isn't very old. You decide to sell it, and the developers actually still hasn't passed over the responsibility to a company and right. and it gets a bit complicated and again you get solicitors don't understand that um but it shouldn't generally be a problem right well simon this has been really fantastic we've been going for 42 minutes nearly um which is Fun. Long, longer than i thought um um but i i would just like to wrap this up is there anything you'd like to add at this point i think i just reiterate what you said you know when you guys are going to choose a, a conveyance uh, i would really go on recommendation don't necessarily go on what the estate agent says but go on ask your friends and family well maybe not family but friends who who have you actually used and recommendation can be really powerful yes and when you look at the conveyancer when you your interaction be comfortable with them are you happy with them what's it like when they pick up the phone do they pick up the phone quickly when you ask for a quote do you get the quote quickly that will tell you quite a lot about the firm if you've got to get through a receptionist and then you've got to get through a secretary and then you finally get to speak to a solicitor who appears to be rather elderly and doesn't really know what they're doing. And then it takes three days to get the quote. Is that really someone you want to be dealing with? So you've really got to be get use someone that's absolutely on it. Um, and it's a specialist. And look at their website. Have they won any awards for what they've done? You know, do they look like they just do conveyancing? If they do loads of other stuff. Are they really going to be specialists? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And there's that old adage, isn't there, that the way someone does one thing is the way they do everything. So if if it's if it's a if it's a painful process even getting a quote. <laughs> it says a lot. It's, yeah. It says a lot. Yeah. It's yeah, they're not really in it for yeah. Um so guys, again, for those of you who are new to home buying and you're a first time buyer, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, Simon, um, you you will have a better chance of any offers you make being accepted if you're competing against other people at around about the same amount. If you can say, I've already got my conveyancer lined up. So if you accept my offer, I can instruct my conveyancer the same day. Well, I would just say not only that you've got your, your, your conveyancer lined up, you've already been through the ID process, the funding arrangements process, and that your solicitor confirms that they're happy with the funding and they're happy with the ID that that means that that person is already two or three weeks ahead of anyone else wow okay that's gold absolute gold dust so there you are guys so i you know what's happening out there whatever the, the market is doing you get these i get a lot of stories every single day from people saying oh my god i found a flat and there were lots of people bidding on it so you know at the lower end of the price ranges you are going to see there's more competition when a good well-priced property comes on and so there are things that you can do that don't cost you any extra that massively improve your chances of having your offer accepted. And, and that's just being a couple of steps ahead of the process. It doesn't cost you any money to be a couple of steps ahead of the process. So having a conveyancer and being able to say, I'm already gonna be using such and such a firm, I've already said set up with them, they've done the uh, KYC, uh, know your client, anim the checks they need to do. So I'm a couple of weeks ahead. Your offer, you know, when, you, when the estate agent is talking to the client saying, well, we've got these guys, they haven't got a conveyance lined up yet. These guys have already, so they're two or three weeks ahead. Those sellers who are looking for a quick sale, 
and most of them often are at that point yeah you know at no extra cost to yourself you are massively improving the chance of your offer being accepted and it's amazing how many people go in there and make offers with nothing ready nothing lined up uh, i know it's incredible so it's you know this is easy these are easy things for you to do so find a conveyancer you're impressed with not just you think is okay but someone that you think oh wow, actually much more impressive that company talk to people locally if they've got a really strong recommendation there needs to be a strong recommendation um talk to the agent if they're an independent one and you trust that they are if they say to you i always recommend this guys because i've been working with them for years and they get my deals through over the line and I, you know that that's a much better answer than oh we 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 are we're aligned with this firm and we just put all our business through this firm and uh, yeah no well, they just give you a list they give you a list of five try any of these which oh, yeah. absolutely yeah. tells you nothing right. Yeah, walk away from that. Yeah. Um, but if you can't find anyone that you like and you would like to use Thomas Legal, please go to the, the link at the book that what's on screen now. It's also in the link in the description below, mhwc.co.uk slash convincing. Pop your details in there and one of Simon's people will give you a call. Um, so with that done, just double check there aren't any. Oh, uh, yeah, that's sorry. Sylvia, do you need convincing on new builds? Yes, you do. Whatever you're buying, new build or old build, you'll need convincing. And on new builds, please, please make sure you get a survey. And it sounds stupid, oh, but yeah. with new builds, I'm sad to say the quality of construction, sadly, tends to be much worse than some of the older stuff that you use, the older stock. And I've had lots of clients who have had horrific problems um, with, with surveys. So something in the press actually last week, which I put on LinkedIn about this, you know, get a survey. Get, don't automatically say, oh, it's a lovely new build. Yeah, Sometimes yeah, the yeah, quality yeah. is not good. But yes, you do need conveyancing. Yeah, and because, sadly, that, that can be complicated yeah. as well as a new build. Those surveys can reveal what like ground movement and stuff like that, which has nothing to do with the fact that it's built new. It's, it's where it's built and what it's built on. Um, I think this is, so Jay Lomax has actually already been in touch with your guys and has a call set up with one of your guys on Saturday. So that's cool. Uh, ba, 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 ba. there's still good comments and questions coming in God, it's always hard to wrap these things up um, there's a question there about can you help with legal work involved in selling part of your land to your property yes we can do that it's called a transfer of part um, if you're selling um, part of your property you do need to get if you've got a mortgage over the property you've got to get the mortgage lender's consent first because if you can imagine you've got a house with a great big garden yeah. mm -hmm. and you decide to sell off half the garden to your neighbor, yeah, the value actually could be affected. You might get a nice few quid from the neighbor, but actually the value of your own property and therefore the security, the mortgage, the, the amount that, the, that that's been lent to you could, could need to change. So you must do that first. Um, one quick question here, I think it's good for you. Gothmog again says, so part of the problem is simply some convincing firms just take on too much work. Yeah, I mean, I said that, we, you know, during the during the two years we had that boom, those boom times, um, we made a very quick decision. We're only going to take on X amount of work because otherwise people get burnout. And and sadly, yes, conveyancing firms are greedy, take on too much work. And then the whole process slows down even more. And it's happened for years and years and years. If you don't control your volumes. You end up in trouble. Yeah. You, you're not in control and everyone's going to get frustrated. And you're going to lose money and you're going to lose clients right thank you very very much um Pleasure. for this it's been a great conversation um and guys keep your questions coming put them in the comments below if you're watching this after the live stream um and i will pester simon to get into those comments and answer any of your questions that come up um no uh, and uh yeah give us your feedback as well anything we didn't talk about you'd like to know um but in the meantime Good luck with your move. Get your ducks in a row. Get your mortgage and principal. You're conveyancing. Your search pack ready to buy if your offer's accepted. And if you can't find people you're happy with, come and talk to my guys. Um, I'm here to try and help make moving easier for everybody um, if I can, along with working with these guys. And it's so nice, David. Sorry, Simon. Sorry. It's so nice having conversations with people who just quite clearly know their stuff and can come onto a live stream without any preparation to take live questions and you know what you're talking about this is this this is like you said there there are people you want to work with and there are people you don't want to work with and it's just very very nice working with competent people who know what they're talking about and that's what you want when you're moving house um simon thank you very very much thanks everyone for watching we'll see you on the next one um remember disregard the guff <laughs>